Welcome back. Welcome back. I'm your host, Soli. And once again, we got another exclusive guest. Always love helping out the little guy, let alone uh, introducing all kinds of talents and reminding other people that you can make what you want of your life and your career. And here to join us is the author with a personal quest himself, it is Chicago native John Osment. Welcome. Welcome to the show. Welcome. How's it going? Ah, uh, delightful. How about yourself? <laughs> Uh, we're doing pretty good. Uh, the news has been kind of interesting. Has anybody seen that uh, the, the Mexican government has said that they have aliens? <laughs> I've, I've seen all kinds of stuff. It just seems like we're just still in dark times, and this is what we keep foreshadowing in all our sci-fi shows. <laughs> At this point, I could literally look outside and see a gray alien smoking a cigarette and I'd be like, oh yeah, that, that tracks. It must be Tuesday. <laughs> Perfect. So uh, you've been publishing a lot of your novels on Amazon Prime, and uh, uh, but where did it all begin? Where did the interest come to just remind yourself, hey, I got a story to tell and my own fictional universe with my own thoughts and feelings to reflect on today's lifestyles? I've been writing since I was a kid and little short stories, and it kind of just more perpetuated when I was in college, when I went for film and broadcast, and we had the script writing portion, which is what I kind of gravitated more towards, and it was after college that there was a buddy of mine who said, excuse me, you should go apply for this uh, independent uh, movie that was being made and was really kind of vague about it. And it turns out they were making this independent Batman film. And it was like completely kind of like what um, the company Bat in the Sun does now. But it was fan like, films. Yeah, yeah, fan films, like really on the up and up. And they had like a budget. I auditioned for it. I auditioned for the third Robin, Tim Drake. I got it. And I might write like a physical novel about the experiences that I have because, oh my God, it was an absolute travesty getting there. Um, I auditioned for it. And after reading the physical script that wasn't part of like the audition process, it was literally one of the worst things I have ever read in my entire life. If I can <laughs> find that physical copy that I have after all these years and everything, I should put it online. I don't know how correct you want me to be without using profanity or going into it oh yeah we can we can discuss mild stuff like that like asshole jerk you know <laughs> okay so in the script there was a literal scene i am not joking this is verbatim in the script it says interior wayne manor library bruce wayne looks back at dick grayson after having an argument where he realizes that he has to put that gay side of himself away there was a literal there was a, a scene in there where to be he, subtle let alone just exactly more telling instead of showing well then he shows that before then batman in the bat cave in this section had a pink bat suit that he put away as like you know a, a visual metaphor and i'm like i told and i'm not going to say names for legal reasons because this person has recently had legal trouble and they're still in the the, the court proceedings but uh, well, I'm just going to call him Peter. And he, he, you know, he talks like this. Every time I, I tell this story, I have to I have to use his little leprechaun. Uh, he reminds me of a leprechaun or the Travelocity gnome. But he was like, yeah, you, you have to see that the meta textual point of it is he realized that being gay is wrong. And I'm like, Peter, you do realize we can't do something like that. And he was like, oh, trust me, it's going to be fine. And he, there was just more shenanigans and stupidity from him like that. And it came to a head where uh, me and Scott, that was our Batman, we did all of the uh, the costume fittings and stuff. I actually got the cast together and proposed the idea to completely rewrite the script from ground up, which is what I did, to his behest. And he was like, okay, yeah, sure, whatever. And everybody was happy because I pulled them aside and I said, there's no way we are going to put this out there in the public. Because when I was promised onto it, the audition material and what the actual script was, he was being very not direct with the script until I sat and read it. And then, uh, to make a long story short, he ended up uh, stealing the entire budget and disappearing. And the movie was never made. Um, there's way too many things that happen with him legally now that he's still in limbo he with. Seems like but, a piece of work. Just someone who oh, just was, hates everybody and just oh, wants was, to diss him. 
he, he was just a total piece of shit. But within that, I met another buddy of mine, Charlie, who he was a VFX animator. And he came to me out of that. He was like, oh, I heard you were involved with this, that, and the other thing. And he was like, I'm trying to work on, again, I seem to be following these circles where he wanted to make something kind of like um, Audie Shanker and the, the deboot universe that he has of like, um, he wanted to do these really cool animated like mini series. And he was like, um, these are not sanctioned by Marvel. Um, what characters would you like to do? Cause I'd like to bring you on after that. And the two characters I wanted to do, I wanted to do my own version of ghost writer and I wanted to do toxin, which for Marvel nerds, toxin is the son of carnage and had a mini series in Oh four. It was pretty, pretty good i i loved it i love that character but i kind of hate what marvel did with it but we wanted to go forward with that that ended up not happening and it just kind of became this series That's of the fun of fan films you can basically yeah. say hey i'm doing my own take on what yeah. i always perceived this character as i mean star trek fan films were a big thing until exactly Paramount cock blocked them and said oh even though you're not making money off them you're you're damaging our intellectual property so we're going to just sue you Oh, I'll, I'll get into that because while we didn't get animation, <laughs> I kind of went into the route of graphic novel, which is something I didn't really know a lot about because I come from a screenwriting and like a TV, like writing background and kind of was nice. kind of jour journeying my way through it. And through that, over the years, I started doing that Toxin project, but in graphic novel, and I have an entire folder of stuff with dozens of artists we were in different stages of development to a point where i can kind of say that um there was a pitch package released or talked about and discussed with marvel they passed on it but what is incredibly interesting mind you this was around 2018 where specific mm -hmm. amounts of images in behind the scenes were on our public art station page granted again in that keyword public it'll go into what i'm saying i did a double glance when a buddy of mine who is also a comics nerd, said, hey, this looks very familiar. If you look at the outfit of the Teenage Toxin that was released in one of the runs in 2020, it's identical to the shit that we have. Not down right. to the story, but physically, if you put the images side by, they completely rip me off. And I could say that because I have definite basis to show, hey, this was not a coincidence. Somebody had to be like, hey, why don't we just use this not in the story or anything but it was one of those that just kind of kept happening and uh there was an almost where we have uh with a group of people that i put together before covid uh, i was deep in talks with boob studios that does the power ranger comics because i have a pitch for a series that we have half of episode one before you know the whole covid thing happened um how familiar <laughs> are you with like the the power rangers franchise or brand are you like a 90s kid uh, I, I would catch various parts of it. I've seen the movies and it was one of those, I, I can't tell you any of the names or I can name yeah. some of the actors. I mean, uh, but all I'm going to say is, oh, Pink Ranger, Green Ranger. Uh, but I, 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 I've encountered some of the martial arts and stunt teams from them. Always nice people, been on all yeah. kinds of productions, serious or campy. Uh, uh, what was it like promoting stuff for Saban Entertainment? Uh, it wasn't through Saban. It was we were doing an independent thing. And then we got in contact with Boom Studios. That is a separate entity that makes the Power Ranger comics. And they were interested where we were going. And they wanted to kind of pick us up because we were doing everything grassroots through indie means. And the premise of the story, I still hope I can finish it one day. It was through the original Power Rangers franchise. There was always the original five and then the Green Ranger came on and then he became the White Ranger and such and such. But the premise of the the, the whole thing was to flip the entire genre on its head because I wanted to turn kind of what Netflix did with like Daredevil and things like that with Power Rangers with the premise being there have always been seven Rangers that there was this mysterious character. Seven that, Samurai. <laughs> exactly. But there was this character and everyone's like, wait a minute, why why does nobody remember him it kind of it's like stephen king's it with power rangers where it's like they're all adults and this character comes to the original team and say hey we have to come together because our old foes came back but they're like who the hell is this guy like literally nobody <laughs> remembers him and it goes through that psychological deconstruction of what these kids would go through if you were a 15 slash 16 year old kid 
recruited by an intergalactic wizard to fight a space witch with robotic dinosaurs in like a saving private ryan setting like these kids they would be sold (laughs) they would be they're all mentally fucked in the head like all of them especially tommy the green ranger who who was evil who lost powers who got powers who was always fighting this darkness inside that he didn't want to become that again which is i think they went that route in the comics i haven't read everything that boom oh, this does. is eye opening i didn't know they made comics of those yeah boom has done runs since like 2018 ish it's the, a lot of them are pretty good i haven't really caught up with a lot of them but them and idw seem to have always cracked that they were always the ones yeah. going for like a cult show or an underseen movie franchise that oh yeah like... they did they significantly improved what the show tried to do with like a more like modern cw ish kind of edge without you know kind of some of the cringe <laughs> that was involved and less of the camp but, and cheap setting yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah. I wanted to like I wanted to remove that from our series that we were doing because there was like deep themes of like mistakes and abandonment and like uh, psychological torment that these characters were put under because for all intents and purposes, um, Audie Shanker, who was another uh, creator that I, I kind of cite a lot, where he basically, um, he, him and Joseph Kahn, they made a, a famous R-rated Power Rangers like parody that was out there. You might have seen it. It was there like a couple of years ago. It, it was infamous all over, but he made the point, and it's the point that I made. They were basically child soldiers, if you think about it. They were like child soldiers recruited in order to do this whole thing. And unfortunately, we only got 15 pages of the first episode done. And COVID happened. And oh. yeah. And then it just never ended up being. And again, similarly, I had the issue of I'd find artists, I'd find people, and, and things would just things would happen because for the most part, we're doing this on an indie basis and putting together comics is incredibly difficult. It wasn't until the controversy started coming around when AI became available through Mid Journey mm-hmm. that I thought the possibility i dug out one of my old scripts for uh, a movie that i wrote in college called the garfield hemingway experience and i sat through mid journey kind of fumbling around because i kind of took that script out and i thought i don't know if it's here so i kind of was just tinkering around with some ideas i had this idea originally when mid journey 3 came out like the very crude if you've seen the um marvel secret invasion intro that's kind of where mid journey and ai in terms of art was it was this opaque not very well detailed thing Mm. and i was trying to use it to make i had this idea for a superman series that was set in the 1800s where it would be clark kent slash superman in a world that has batman and a marvel character in a world that has Batman, <laughs> the Marvel characters all in the same universe, but it'd be Clark Kent going from year to year, realizing that he's leaving everything behind because he's an immortal God, like trying to go through everything. And unfortunately, while the scripting phase was easy, the art phase, it was not there. And it was completely not going to work at all. And I tried going through the previous channels and Warner Brothers essentially told me to fuck off because they, they were like, oh, well, we're not interested because we have everything that's here and, you know, Warner Brothers being Warner Brothers, the least I can talk about them without them suing me is probably the best. But digging out that original script, I, through Mid Journey, got a very rough version of the Garfield Hemingway experience to kind of go into the way the story is. I can't really talk about it without you reading it because all I can say is it's about a man named Garfield who wakes up in the desert and really weird things start happening that defy reality and he doesn't know who he is or how he got there but when Mm. you start seeing the story uncover and unfold itself it's like a psychological mind fuck and trying to get that with mid mid journey version three I thought it was okay but then like in my inexperience I did I'm not an artist and with AI there's the whole controversy, I guess we can get into that, of is AI-generated art considered art? In my opinion, after doing all the research, I don't believe so. I believe it's substitutive. Like, kind of like Andy Warhol doing photos of other photos. It's like, well, so... The way, the way I would compare it, and it's a really weird comparison, it's like vegan meat versus real meat. <laughs> yeah. It's 
it when I was started working on the version three, then version four came out. And mind you, I still didn't know like the basic fundamentals of like how to create a graphic novel. So it was in different states until where my inexperience came in and through Mid Journey version four and three, I was able to produce 26 graphic novels. And out of the 26, now that we have, five are actually like presentable and readable and working through it because version four was not great and it could have been something, but I really didn't crack the code until recently. And to kind of bring it out there, I can't use Mid Journey right now because they banned me and they won't tell me why. <laughs> Oh, they, wow. I believe what it was, I had my auto renew turned off because it's $30 a month with the service that I was using and was having some financial issues and decided to turn it off. And they charged me for it anyway. And I went to the bank and uh, auto uh, reversed it. And months later, didn't hear anything from Mid Journey, didn't use it because I was thinking of after the last book that I did, I'm like, you know, I think I might, you know, want to get on the horse again, even though despite the controversy, just to do something creatively for my own sanity. And I looked at my Discord server and it says, you have been banned. And there's no way to contact anybody unless you're in the Discord, but you can't get there because you're banned. <laughs> yeah, ridiculous. So, yeah, it's it's absolutely stupid. And I don't know why, because there's nobody to talk to and support won't help me. So I may or may not have ways around it. But going back to it, when I found... Um, I did so many different versions of the Garfield Hemingway experience. I have one of the physical copies that I tried through Amazon when I was ex still experimenting with physical print. And after going through it and figuring out certain tools, because let's let's be honest, when you're using AI for comics, despite the controversy, yes, I'm aware of the ethical implications and the societal impact of art itself. And that does present a concern. But I've always said to people that we can do it in an ethically sourced way possible, that if you have an idea for something and you truly do not have another way to do it, I would rather try something experimental than to never let that idea be out there. And that's what I've done. And I don't necessarily agree with a lot of the quote AI art community because a lot of them are under the false pretense that it's the same thing and I'm not it's not for me to say because I am not an artist if anything I'm a technician but the way that I work with the software is incredibly finicky and difficult trying to get something serviceable to sequential quote art with this is incredibly complicated and I'm not going to give away like a lot of the methods that I use because a lot of it is something that I could use for my own experience if that like kind of thing comes up but with it you are able to go through into really complex and long stories all of the graphic novels I've done I think except for one are all over 200 pages and trying to get a graphic novel done in a month is I know record time but when you go through and sit down how many complicated shots or shots that get fucked up because the AI doesn't understand what you need uh, it's usually 50% luck and then 50% random that you'll get what you need because transitioning a physical script into AI, say you need three characters in a room, one wearing a blue hat, one wearing a green hat, and one wearing, wearing a red hat, it'll completely, it'll, it won't even understand that because it's like yeah. talking to a toddler. It's like telling a toddler, I need you to draw this green horse on a red hill. The toddler will hand you a bunch of scribbles and you're like, what the fuck is this? And the mm -hmm. AI doesn't know any better. But with experimenting, the recent book that I just did kind of goes more into like all the techniques that I've used because it's a really complicated process, especially with graphic novels. And like I've said, I was just going to do whatever it took to try to get something out there. And there is backlash, understandably, but certain people in the comics industry, I'm not going to name names, have said, oh, well, that's interesting and at least experimental where you're open about it because I don't say like blatantly on the advertising that it is AI. But if you read where my the artists are list, it says, and the evil machine empire. And if you can't discern what that implies, then I'm sorry, I can't help you. <laughs> it's a fine line between just like programming art to actually work versus kind of like even, dare I say, comparing it to the likes of 
dubstep where everything's literally yeah. been taken illegally so copywriting yeah. is pointless you literally have already stolen there, there, there is the thing it. what you, we don't know where the images are coming from we can guess where the open sourcing is but like there's no way to prevent it or there's no way currently in as we're recording this now there is no way to like give compensation if that was a thing to anybody because i mean the way that i've done it certain people have tried in the artist style i don't do that i just do certain parameters and prompts that i have found and worked through because um through making graphic novels i'm not using directly prompts i'm using tools within mid journey to create cohesive panels which is incredibly complicated and takes a lot of time because you need to be able to create fluidity through like the basic comic principles which is what i've done mostly i mean when you look at it it is what it is at the end of the day i did the best that i could i'm not an artist i've asked people for help and what to do but you keep getting all these cold shoulders yeah well not cold shoulders just some people be like oh that's really cool or some people like yeah go fuck yourself and it's like i don't know what you want me to do Uh, unless i've already gone through multiple different crowdfundings for artists in the past and came up short and i don't know if it was due to marketing or what or the economy or covid or what but the people that are saying oh just hire an artist okay are you gonna help me so i can achieve that because artists do need to be paid. I financially can't do that on my own. And people are going to say, oh, well, isn't that an excuse? Well, no, it's if you have the means to do something creative, you should do it while the iron is hot. And yes, mm-hmm. well, like I've stated, there is controversy. I don't necessarily agree with the ethical natures of it. It's going to be one of those, if you truly have an idea for something and you think it's good, then fuck everybody else that doesn't agree with you. I mean, everybody can, we could sit there and argue till the cows come home about AI taking jobs and everything. The arguments that I made thousands of times, or we can actually sit down and focus and talk about the story and story itself and the nature of human creativity. Use it in the best way possible while the other admins try to police it. Um, It reminds me a little bit of... uh, how people were getting mad on TikTok, how there'd be a filter to avoid songs with risque lyrics. And of course, there was always some with foul mouth lyrics that got through. And it's like, well, yeah, it's kind of like when you put the parental controls on digital equipment, there's still going to be something that gets through that you're like, hmm, that's a little too risque or violent for my liking. <laughs> exactly. There's always going to be problems. And there's just look at it now, like on TikTok. I don't I don't I'm not on TikTok, but I like see the afterflow with other things like the AI yeah, music that's out over. there, yeah. the AI music that's out there, the AI deep fakes and everything. It's just it's a whole other market. But I like to divorce myself as much as I can from that to say, hey, Hey, I went experimental with this and tried to tell stories that I felt like I believed in. Like with your resources. Garfield. Yeah, like the Garfield Hemingway experience. Um, my second book that's that was ended up being in this trilogy of books that I made out of the five. The second one, mind you, all these are incredibly weird out there books. The second one is called The Spatial Calamity and the Specimen of Endangered Flowers. It's about this guy who can time travel through dreams, and it's about what you would do if you are tasked by an organization to go back and stop something from happening, but in in turn, you decide to go against the grain and try to reverse that decision. And it goes like through like free will and it kind of all of the themes of the stories and scripts that I use set, have an underlying tone of AI being the moral implication to the story as like an as a metaphor for a lot of the things that are in there. And I think a lot of the people that have had negative things to say kind of either missed that or it wasn't really well stated. But there's a lot of themes of like authoritarianism and a lot of that baked in and that's kind of like other themes of like free will and everything and that kind of goes into the ai itself because it's like goes into consciousness about like how conscious is the ai itself like is it learning with you and adapting because in certain aspects i've seen it like learn and adapt to the styles that i do and i didn't teach it that through mid journey like it'll learn and adapt to the style that I've created. And it's really weird because it'll know like where I need to place panels. It'll know where I need to do things, but their into itself goes to the artificial intelligence portion of it. Uh, that, that makes sense. And it tracks, but it, but why do you think we just can't have any civil conversations? 
Why is everyone it's, so quick to say off with its head or it's great, screw you guys? It's it's human nature. When we're presented with a obstacle that threatens to destroy a way of life, kind of goes into it. Um, this might seem like a random tangent, but it goes to it. Why it's the same reason why we don't have renewable energy sources besides coal or anything else. Because if something else is presented that might destroy an operation, either good or bad, we present it as a threat and needs to be destroyed. It's kind of why a lot of the art community banned it on art station to ban all AI art because they viewed it as a threat without actually researching or understanding it. Because I can see where their concerns are, especially with the WGA strikes and the strikes that are going on currently. There is definitely the threat of AI replacing actors because the studios have gone in and digitally replaced, excuse me, actors in the background of shows they were never in. And there's a lot of things with AI that they just look at um, the recent Flash movie that came out. It was accused of using AI uh, with a lot oh, of Oh, absolutely did. Yeah, and people are like, oh no, it's CGI. I'm like, CGI doesn't look that wonky. And some of the VFX editors are being really coy about it. I'm not here to accuse them of AI, but when, spoiler alert, when you bring back Christopher Reeve and bring back older actors, and the bringing back of George Reeves was kind of um, sick in a way. I could see why people are like, wow, that was really distasteful, but it, it, it comes into question if it was CGI or AI, because it feels like they just took photographs and fed it into an AI, and you're like, wow, that looks kind of like shit. <laughs> I think we're getting out of our... Everyone's getting their, slowly getting their heads out of their ass, realizing, hey, you can hide behind millions of dollars, but that doesn't change the end goal or product. That's you another know? reason why I wanted to branch. There's, there's some stuff that I'm working on right now that's... Um, the nature of comics itself, because it kind of, it's the same thing with movies, TV, video games. The nature of the medium has to change in order for creative expansion to thrive. And it's more prevalent right now with movies. Big, like huge tentpole blockbuster movies, they're bombing left and right. I mean, it, it's sad when the fucking Barbie movie was the highest grossing movie like so far that they've had, which I mean, it was the whole cultural zeitgeist that kind of boosted that. But when the tentpole Marvel movies in DC are flopping left and right, something is not something isn't clicking where like five years ago, this, these all should have been hits. I think people are starting to wake up and realize that the tentpole franchise movies are like on their way out. And it's kind of the you same. Got so problem. many movies based on toys. Yeah. And it's Star like, Wars is basically based a toy commercial half the time. If you don't think even about get it. me started on Star Wars because like the whole fan base it, it'll just give me a brain the fan base and, hates well, each other that's really rupturing that's, spleens that, that's that's why i somebody usually asks me about star wars and i won't ever talk about it because i don't i don't get into star wars i don't get into star trek i don't get into lord of the rings because it just doesn't really grab me and i just can't stand the fan base because it's like you can't have or enjoy anything anymore because everything has to be a divided spec everything has to be a divided spectrum of you're either you either really love this or really hate this and it's like i i don't really ascribe to any of that i don't that doesn't really do anything for me uh I, i'm with you i that's kind of how i was with uh rick and morty i just was oh, hearing God. this and it had nothing to do with the content i was just like i'm kind of out of cartoons it looks fine for what it is i like the talent sutter work and then seeing just all these fans be toxic they were kind of like the breaking bad guys but they weren't in on the joke and There's... then and then the voice actor playing morty was also not much different in real life so i'm like yeah that's i just i'm gonna stay away from that for now yeah everything is just i really hate a lot of the fan bases especially with marvel dc a lot of them and even even in comics i think we can break into that where a lot of comics and movies have to change because how many times have people been tired of Batman stories and Superman stories and Spider-Man taking the brunt and being turned into absolute dog shit runs because comics, while they are a versatile medium that has existed for God knows how long now, at a certain point, you run out of shit to, 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 to go through. How many times yeah. do we have a Batman Joker story about like 700 at a certain point? 
there's um, Robert Kirkman's Invincible actually had an end and people were like, what? This is groundbreaking. It's like, oh, it's groundbreaking that stories have to have an end. <laughs> it's like, I'm it's funny were... you bring him up. I'm surprised he still has a career given how he's been a nightmare behind the scenes to work for. Oh, God. Yeah. Um, so many things with Marvel and DC have to adapt and change because it's this it's the self-defeating prophecy of money over substance, which I know money makes the world go round, but you can't just keep feeding your fan base the same bullshit for years. It's so many Spider-Man fans are going to the alternative media like in movies and video games, excuse me, to get their material when a lot of the mainstream comics where everything was based on is all crap. One of my best friends is a diehard Spider-Man fan with multiple Spider-Man tattoos and literally hates a majority of the Spider-Man stuff because I can't keep up with it. That's another problem. You can't keep up with comics these days. Everything is either ties into a giant event to sell more comics or it's some other thing that was a continuity that nobody read from 20 years ago. That's definitely my problem. It's like, I go by the police academy rule. Stop after seven installments. Exactly. Um, if you keep going and going and going, you oversaturate, and eventually everything underperforms, and then you have to go back to the drawing board. It's kind of like with James Bond. Oh, why didn't it work? I'm like, because you were doing five movies every decade. It's too much. Exactly. And there's an inherent thing. I'm trying to trying to be careful how I talk about this because there's projects that I'm working on that I'm still trying to get off the ground. You're familiar with the show The Boys, right? Yes. I'm working on a graphic novel series that's like, it's not set in the world of The Boys, but in the tone of like the TV show where it's a deconstructionist, but it's a deconstruction on the different archetypal superheroes. Like there's one we have on Superman, but it's like a legit Superman character, but brought into a different lens. We have another character that's a Batman deconstruction, but it's from the deconstruction construction of like taking the oversaturation of batman and bringing it down to a real world context if, if you break it down psychologically this character is fucking nuts and like you bring down all of the the tropes and his world and everything and bring it into a fresh original character there are certain things that you start to notice like red flags like not the villains itself but like just the archetype itself where those archetypes have not changed much since the 30s or the 40s when they were created i think something within the realm of changing the status quo might be the best thing because i know like they tried with the boys comic and the boys comic series was it, the less we talk about that, the, the, the show definitely improved that. I've, that I've been told about that. It, it makes it more aware of the characters being toxic, but it is, it's kind of like, that's the only reason I think the Captain America movies did well is he acknowledged, okay, I'm being used as a propaganda tool. Exactly. And that's, that's why a lot of certain franchises have difficulty being adapted into other things. Like we haven't had, a, we had, we've had like five to seven Superman movies, like five different Batman franchises. We've had one. And simultaneously, mind you. Yeah, simultaneously. And then like, we've had, wait, we've had only, maybe a few years. before. Now. We've had what, two Wonder Woman projects with Linda Carter and Gal Gadot. And we've had two uh, technically three flash projects um if you're not aware uh, we before the grant gustin tv show we had a failed justice league of america 1990s pilot mm -hmm. yep. yeah that pilot that ended up not happening thank god that was god that was fucking horrible <laughs> yep. at, least, at least i talk about that the better but it was bad Oh, it was really bad, especially when Green Lantern's effects were like something that was done out of Windows Movie Maker. And you're like, guys, that's that's the best you got. But on a uh, TV show budget, I mean, hell, Smallville did it better. I mean, <laughs> yeah, that says a lot. <laughs> Cheap. That, well, I mean, CW look at Babylon and... 5. Its graphics were garbage. They're trying to remaster them now on Blu-ray, but it doesn't matter because the story is good. Yeah, that's the thing is everything now has to be a remake or a retread or we're in the nostalgia bait era where they just where they're bringing back they've brought back 70 year old Michael Keaton to play Batman they got Tobey Maguire and Andrew Garfield all to come into the same movie you got Tom Cruise back for Top Gun they're trying to get Peter Weller back for another RoboCop I'm like are you are you sure about that mm -hmm. I don't know 
it's like we're living in an age where we're coming out of the original idea, which is not something that is entirely new, but the idea of cinema itself, there's actually a, a really good short film you should check out called Stalled. It was on YouTube. It was this 19 minute short movie that it was like a giant breath of fresh air because of it takes place in one room with one actor playing multiple roles. And it's just in a bathroom. And it's this premise of this guy who gets stuck in a time warp in a bathroom and he keeps repeating the same the same time over and over and over again. And different versions of himself are trying to go through it and try to figure out how they got stuck there. Uh, I dig that. That goes back to the whole George Romero. One one idea, one location. Exactly. Action. That's kind of some of the things that I do is like with AI itself, you're very limited to how many characters you can put in because of the consistency problem. The consistency problem can help and hurt you in the same right, but it'll help with psychological stories that deal with very heady subjects. One of my books, X115KQ37, the premise of that is there's like a normal office worker who goes through the day-to-day motions working at a nondescript office, but really weird paranormal uh, events start happening. Like people start acting differently and they start going into this murderous rage where there's this weird entity that's telling them to unleash their inner inner inhibitions. And it leads to the rapture where all conceivable reality is falling apart. And he's the, the office worker is goes into this vortex where he's watching all of reality fall apart. And there's an observer of reality whose name is Norm, who is a man with a goat's head who starts talking to him about all conceivable reality is falling apart. And through that, you're able to see different v- variations of reality that could or couldn't be. And through the AI, you're able to see that. But in that, you're also kind of limited with not necessarily the imagination, but the AI itself, because all the ideas that I wrote down from the original script, I either couldn't do successfully. If I wanted to hire an artist, it would take two, maybe three years to fully like sit down and write and try to paint out all of the like giant splash page ideas that I had. But with AI itself, you're able to sort of kind of get there. I got physical copies that are out now. (laughs) Excuse me. I'm hoping that they actually transfer really well because after, besides doing the final edit, I haven't really delved into reading the material that's out there. I'm more interested in the audience feedback because so far being very indie, you don't really have a lot of reach or exposure or anything. And I'm kind of interested to see people's opinions out there and kind of seeing what what they think of it because i haven't really gotten much feedback other than people from the ai art community and the less i talk about that controversy the better <laughs> i've noticed we, we we've talked about this literally every other episode it seems like we're now coming to terms with the fact that so many people are insecure and that is what leads to all these pointless arguments you can say they're an argument it needs to happen i'm like but ultimately you feel like shit and you wish you just hadn't wasted your time because you didn't understand any more than you already did. And it it's like everyone's having to realize, well, until everyone just lets their fears go, they're just going to keep coming off as unpleasant. Yeah, the AI art community is either they're very in their own mindset of like they're they're very pro AI, anything else that has a staunch tilt to their belief then you're immediately an anti-ai which is why i label myself as basically 50 50 i'm more so anti a lot of the the methods and like i think trying to blend it with like for backgrounds or conceptual art is probably the more uh, probably the way that you should be using it like i don't necessarily think this is coming like from a hypocritical standpoint that we should make entire books with it but experimenting with it is at least a good idea and concept and maybe the execution might be might speak for itself but i thought you know at this point fuck it might as well might as well just do it and see what happens yeah yeah you might as well there's um one of the other books that I guess I can promote is called The Pendulum, and this book was incredibly difficult. It took me three months to make, which I know even in graphic novel is record time, but 
it's a neo noir murder mystery about Love this it. F- already sold. <laughs> it, but the thing that I sold it is it's in different color spectrum hues, each different aspect of it. It's this FBI agent um, whose name is Charlie Mars, who's going through um, and I can link you to d- different uh, aspects of it. It's it's set in multiple different colors. It starts out in red, then it goes into yellow, then it goes into green, blue, all these different hues. Every time a new victim is placed or there's something to the story, it changes the color of it to different perspectives. Like the whole hue is like it's a watercolor like hue. It's in different watercolor styles mm-hmm. and trying to trying to do that with the consistency that I needed, there are certain points when you're using AI, because I'm not an artist and there's a lot of people that, oh, I can pick apart these. Yeah, well, I can't because I'm not an artist, but like certain things in the background, you can pick apart, be like, that looks weird. But from from the perspective of the story, it'll make sense. But trying to thread that consistency through multiple different colors was a fucking nightmare. Like there are certain shots. Oh, I'm sure that would not work like there's there's a part in the story where um ai is notoriously not good for action or movement unless like Mm. now that i know how to do it um it's more of like david fincher's zodiac more than anything else where there's it's the the story is leading into itself with the tension where there's not hardly any action it's more of the suspense of it because trying to get all these shots that i had planned that are not necessarily spoilers, but there was a point where well, who we thought was going to be the killer, there was supposed to be this long, like four, four to eight page chase sequence that was like something out of a like um, early X Files episode. And every time yeah. I went to thread the color, the color either the action looked off, the, the 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 AI gave it three feet, and then I tried asking people that are like good with Photoshop or good with art or other artists that I knew either were unavailable or, or unwilling to do it because it was AI and other aspects of it that I couldn't nail down. Like you try to, I finally found after my recent book, how to thread the consistency to about 85 to 95% before we were maybe at like 81%. And each book has taught me something different, but with the pendulum, it was really hard because that's a 285 page graphic novel. And Good Lord. Yeah, well, the, I write really extensively long books, but the way that I do it, I, I, I structure it like a TV show. So there's episodes in it. So you're able to start, okay. <laughs> you're start able to start and stop. And that's like seven or eight episodes in there. But it has a narrative purpose because every time we get a new suspect or a new victim, you don't know what 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 the ulterior motive is because that we don't really have necessarily a killer we have the audience interpretation of who they think the killer is and you start to see the psychological unraveling of the man versus uh machine in the man versus the monster aspect of like bringing it into the psychology of the fbi investigation of getting into the agent's head and realize that he's becoming a little fucking crazy too so you don't know is like is everything happening because it's in his head or is like everything actually happening which i thought would be interesting and that's how you see there's a point in the story where and it is true in psychology that certain people who are psychopaths and killers they develop certain avatars that they see that are like psychological hallucinations or avatars and one of the avatars we see is a banana man throughout the entire uh-huh. story. And you're not sure, is it from the killer or is it from mm-hmm. the agent himself? Because every time we see the banana man, he's in, there's him and then there's another person next to an object in the distance and they're always talking about the case. And it's led to assume that it's the killer talking about it from his psychology. But each time the characters throughout the story, they have different conflicting opinions and they grow and change and adapt with how the case unfolds into the different colors. And it is really difficult, especially when you're doing the different colors, the dialogue balloons, they change colors through it. And you notice things different evolve and change and the look and feel of everything goes through this weird neo-noir nightmare that it goes through. And it's left on a very ambiguous ending to where it's kind of like the ending of The Sopranos to where uh. it just yeah well i see exactly what you're saying but it's left <laughs> off in a it's left off in a very what you're like uh. what but hopefully it's, it's good, just cool and ambiguous i'm sorry i just yeah I'm not over that 
Especially, no. Well, I, I take it you you just want to just be experimental versus piss off all your fanboys. <laughs> well, I, I didn't have a seven season long, highly successful TV show. The more the mindset that I had for the ending was you have all the facts to it, to it. And if you really go back and read it, you might have a different perspective every time you read it. And that's one of the, the things that I thought would be interesting is every time you go back and read it, you might have a different perspective of like, wait a minute, do I really know all the facts that I, I, I was given? And you try to see that through the different episodes. And a lot of that is what I include. And along with the color spectrum, um, I did this other book called Yellow, which the entire thing is done in black and white and yellow with yellow hues. And it's about this author that he's um, struggling and arguing with the characters inside his universe about the nature of free will and do they actually exist and he's arguing with his own creativity over the loss of something that happened in his life and you see a lot of that book is mainly an AI parallel because there's a lot of implications in all the arguments are the characters arguing with the author himself, basically calling him, you know, um, a cheap knockoff, calling him a hack, calling him this and that because he wanted to go other means as a writer. And it's like that whole thing was brought in a very interesting connection where like a lot of those arguments are brought out there. And it's mm. like for the audience to decide, like, you know, are the points right? Are they inaccurate? Because from the author's perspective, all those arguments and all the characters coming out are actually his anxiety manifested. So basically, you're, you're trying to mainly just bring all the headache inducing conversations and kind of bring them to a close. Sort of, but kind of also go it into its own. The, the whole AI thing is like it's a metaphor through a couple different um, portions of the books only because of the, the nature of it. We never outright explicitly state it, but you can see like the undertones. A lot of what I go into is very psychological and very spiritual and heavy. And like the, um, the, like the book that I, I just did, The Spatial Calamity and the Specimen of Endangered Flowers goes into a lot of like if you had the ability to time travel through your dreams and you had you worked for this clandestine organization that is in charge of observing the universe and they're tasked with giving you like you're supposed to be at this specific point where this person needs to die and you watch them die and then certain forces of the universe are saying did you make the right choice and you start questioning yourself and you decide to go back and change it to like stop yourself from changing it is that actually something you should do and should you mess with the fabric of space and time or should you give into authority mm. surrender of, you know don't surrender your beliefs maybe surrender your dispute you know <laughs> yeah because it goes into a lot of that and a lot of it is it really heady and another thing with spatial is it's kind of a parody on the time travel story which there's multiple different things things in quantum physics and quantum mechanics that I studied and used in it because I have a he I'm a bunch of people in the AI space know me as that weirdo that makes a bunch of weird shit that a bunch of people think that I was on drugs that when I made it but <laughs> yeah nope. everyone likes to jump to conclusions and just deny that there's creativity that's always going to be the oh they're a pothead it's like well how do you know do you know them personally and why does that change their creativity Exactly. If you're able to get something creatively out of something else, then you might as well do it. Uh, I'm open to questions if you have any questions or anything. Uh, mainly, uh, how would you describe your day-to-day -day just creative space in general to bring it all around? Like, And what do you recommend for those getting into it and publishing their own material online? Publishing, I would definitely do your research. It took me so many trials and failures with Amazon. Amazon, I really did not want to go into because of how terrible they are when it comes to, excuse me, changes and trying to figure out. Um, they mainly cater to like soft cover books and hardcover books. They don't really cater to graphic novels. While they have them out there, those are already printed. Um, they don't specifically have a section for graphic novels. So it was a, a lot of trial and error when I first went through it because you have to learn about the dimensions and even where it is right now, it's an eight by 11 and a lot of their stuff, I mean, it fits just enough, but it's still, it's putting a, a bookshelf on a comic. So there's really, 
nothing else you can do on uh, that's free in terms of putting it out there as like instant access. But the day to day creativity, I tell people always try to get some kind of feedback. When you have a story, make sure you you go through about three different versions of the story, the story you're writing, the story that comes out, and then the story that's actually finished and it might be completely different than the other two that you started because when you're writing you're trying to get through all of your ideas and insanity into the same aspect and try to have it be coherent and try to have like a, a beginning a middle and an end sometimes you can do kind of what nolan does you can have an unconventional story you can kind of have a story that goes in a different direction so many people adhere to there has to be certain rules with everything and while to an extent that makes sense i think you can kind of do whatever you want with writing those as are just long gatekeepers you... yeah, yeah at the exactly. time they can't they'll tell you there's rules and then they can't repeat it exactly there's multiple different stories especially with The creative process with AI is you have to have your script in hand true, but most of the time you're just taking bullet points and doing it improv because what you say you need a scene that is a solar eclipse on Chinese New Year for whatever reason. Um, Trying to get that with AI specifically without stable diffusion tools is incredibly difficult. Certain people get away with certain things of doing a combination of Photoshop and AI. I don't have that capability, mostly because I'm not patient enough for it. But I would say to the people that are just starting out, you're always, your first story is always going to be shit. You're always going to fail and you're, um, Don't let that deter you, especially with how many failures I've gone through and frustrating bullshit and politics aside. If you're going into screenwriting, I would always make sure that you are always writing something. Neil Gaiman always said that um, writing is always you're driving on a road that's in the fog and you need to know where you're going at all times because not Every time you drive, you're going to see the end of the destination. Your destination might change and always keep your keep yourself readily available to have scripts. I have at least 50 to 70 scripts on my desk, like at all times, like ready to go, mostly because I'm a a neurotic writer where I just if I have an idea for something I write like one of the, uh, the graphic novel series that I had. I almost finished until I really didn't like how I did the art and I really didn't know what I was doing. So I had to take it back and start over. But this graphic novel series I'm working on right now, um, the, the, the original version, one of them is out there, I think. Um, it's called Guts. It's a what would happen if during the American Civil War, we were actually invaded by aliens mm, and like it, it happened. And it starts with this this uh, sergeant in the Union Army whose name is Christopher Keene. He is under the impression that he's speaking with Lincoln and you see how alternate history would happen of Chris going through the moral implications of not only were we dealing with a sensitive time in our country's history, but imagine being putting fucking aliens into the brink of that, like with our primitive technology, how we actually go through it. And what ends up happening is we decide because it's kind of left to kind of like an X-Files route where it was very small, what the the alien impact was. And it was kind of left to like urban folklore, but how it goes through the present day is it's still in the 1800s, but Chris decides to volunteer as like an experiment of sorts where the United States government is trying to create a version of them through us and it fails and Chris is kind of turned into a combination of us and them. And it's sort of like um, Bram Stoker's Dracula, where he's kind of turned into this otherworldly creature. If you've ever seen District 9, it's kind of like District 9. If it I had love been. that. I love xenophobia, uh, uh, dystopias where you're, and utopias where you're just literally having to show how the lack of resources and prejudices have just pretty much reined people back into a corner now. Exactly. And Chris goes through where he basically turns into a character that's kind of similar to it was it's like legally safe venom, but now he's immortal. And he, he goes through every major war that has happened. And it takes place in the present day 1990s, where Chris has been alive through all of that. And the American people don't know that we were invaded by aliens. And it's like this popular conspiracy theory, but it comes to the front 
when a lot of kind of similar to what we're dealing with now is where there's disclosure happening that we were actually invaded in the 1800s and the government covered it up and um, it's revealed through like this is all like one of the first episodes that's out there is Chris ends up getting revealed by um, former military ops because he had a botched operation in the Gulf in the Gulf War and they revealed uh, revealed dossiers that he's been like a United States government weapon and it causes a political uptick because people are like wait a minute you're, you're telling me we've had a fucking half alien working for the as a weapon of war since the 1800s I and love the government it. the government knew this and covered it up and he's kind of in this moral conflict where he's like I can't die like I literally can't die I have been through every single war I hate my life and I don't know what to do and the only aliens that could have helped me are not on the planet and I have no idea how to get a hold of them and neither do what does our government you've sold me and see i can't even compare this to anything else like not even x-files like this is a very interesting just government weapon uh protagonist with a conscience reflecting on war crimes and uh other surprises around the corner <laughs> yeah i went through seven episodes of it until like the way that i was doing the art it wasn't necessarily sequential it was very rough and then i reached a point where i get to a point as a writer where it's like ugh, endings are hard like to quote uh eric kripke from i'm gonna be really kind of nerd myself here into the uh, one of my favorite shows is uh, the first five seasons of Supernatural on the CW only because it had a certain charm and a feel. It was like that, Phantasm kind of. Yeah, but... Um, on the road. One of the characters for the finale said, endings are hard. Any chapped-ass monkey with a keyboard could uh, type out a beginning, but uh, and it, doing an ending is like near impossible because fans are always going to bitch. People are always going to bitch. There's always going to be holes. But mm -hmm. my ending for it, I didn't get to because I'm like... I didn't feel the design was very, uh, it, it was very crude because it was very, I guess, photo bashed is the word that I want to use because before I found out how to do graphic novel style, everything had that photo bashed feel. If you understand what I mean by photo bashed. Yes. Was, yeah, oh my God. Yeah. A lot yeah. of, I'm going to go on a small side tangent. So many people in the AI space, while they have a good intentions and it looks fluid and stuff, it has that photo bashed look. And it just, I don't mean to be pretentious or come at it from a different standpoint, but so much of that photo bash shit, it just annoys the fuck out of me. Cause everyone's like, Oh, look at the consistency I did in stable diffusion. I'm like, it looks like you Photoshopped a bunch of shit together in a porn game. Like, I'm sorry. And it's like, yeah, my stuff isn't necessarily the best either. But that photo bashed look, it just every time I see it, it just distinctly like turns away my creativity. And I don't know if that's a pretentious writer thing or what, but every time I see it, I'm like, too close to it, probably. I... Yeah, I'm just like, guys, can we do some? Can we do something new with it? Can we do something that hasn't been done visually? And that's what I try to do with every book. I try to do something that hasn't been done visually because as like going into the different books trying to get very heady concepts like they're very hard to wrap around because of from a metaphysical standpoint but when you actually sit down and try to pave it out there's different things that could be done and i wish right now if i hypothetically could get into mid journey i could experiment even <laughs> further but trying to do that right now i'm working on it but when you're banned it's kind of hard but not in the same way you just have to find the money in order to get a mid-journey subscription and uh see if you can get around certain things allegedly potentially wink wink <laughs> fuckers um what are some other sites you recommend for just as a starting point for artwork and self-publishing and let alone just writing material sites um if you're going to use um, for artists, I would always recommend ArtStation above all else, despite my problems I have with them. Um, ArtStation is how I found a majority of my people like um, Edgar Siles. I'm going to shout out Edgar Siles, who was my original um, pencil artist on The Lost Ranger on our Power Ranger series, who he's a really good artist. He's from Costa Rica. His country is going through a lot right now, and all the art and support to him would definitely help, along with uh, my colorist. Um, God, I, there's just so many people I could I could name, and it's really difficult because they're not all English speaking. So it's like, it's difficult because they're in other countries, but 
sites for writing, I would try to, there's multiple different um, YouTube courses online um, from Neil Gaiman, where he talks about story structure. I would look into that. Another one that is really interesting to look into is what Trey Parker and Matt Stone talk about, um, the writers and creators of South Park, where they talk about breaking down an episode. Like they, I'm going to try Try to, I'm probably going to bastardize what they say, but they say if you have a story and if your next sentence is be, uh, and then and then and then, then you don't really have anything. You're kind of just going for the motions. You have this point. Very and, ADD. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And if um, then you the, the point where he was talking about was you need to have this happen. Therefore, this happens. And then therefore, this happens. You need to have everything in the story kind of gel together because some mistakes, and I'm not a, not like a master or anything. I just, I have this weird gift for writing that people have said most of my life. But just from an observationalist standpoint, a lot of people are so wrapped up with it being perfect and have to have like the magnum opus, just write what you feel works for you and let the story guide you because everybody wants to be the next Steven Spielberg. Everybody wants to write, just, just write something down, anything. Like I said, your first story is going to be the worst. I encountered story. snobs like that in film school and you'll find this funny. I, yeah. no one had the decency to tell me what I was doing right or wrong. They're just like, no, nah, it's not ready. I had asked them for more. They became chicken shits. And I finally I took a masterclass. I figured out everything I needed to know. The main thing, staging. Yeah, exactly. But all these fuckers got into it on, oh, well, it has to look like Christopher Nolan. I'm like, you're not going to get that on a $5,000 project for class. But and then the, it got even more just ridiculous. Just like everything must look like a Paul Thomas Anderson or Scorsese film. And if it's not, it sucks. I'm like, well, that's gatekeeping right there. What if we don't like those filmmakers work? Exactly. I'm going to, let's see if I can figure out how to share some of these tools on the whiteboard here. I'm going to show you um, if it'll let me show you how, like what I was talking about. Oh, this is a perfect example right here. How it's the, the nature of what I've been doing, especially experimenting with AI has grown and evolved. I have some of the uh, original, is this it? Yes. Yes. This is some of the original shit. This is, let me figure out how to do this. Uh, we're going to do this live. We're going to do it live. We're oh, doing it wait. live. Fuck it. We'll do it live. Okay. Let's see if it'll let me. Um, There's got to be a way to attach shit here. Okay. Whiteboard. Is that how you oh, ask me know. to sign in? You can kiss my ass. I'll have to figure out. How to... I was trying to figure out how to attach images because it won't let me do that. God damn it. So... Anyway, there is... Um, a beginning that I the, the whole thing you were saying is what led me to go back to the drawing board is people not telling you like how to do things because I didn't know how to do I didn't know proper lettering I didn't know like staging of a I knew staging and all these scene. people could have told us but decided no it's easier for me to bitch instead of be helpful exactly which is a lot of the the 26 that I created a lot of them looking back were very rough and probably very bad from a like a standpoint of not necessarily the writing but just how it was put together because I knew how to make a scene through a movie but I didn't know how to translate that to graphic novel and now that I do it's like endless potential there but yeah nobody tells you how to do anything everybody that was offering help was giving me the most condescending secondhand remarks they're like oh well if you really know what you were doing you would do this it's like well why don't you tell me how to do that then oh well I, you should know what you're doing anyway yeah insecurity once again oh definitely like there's there's so many things it's right now <laughs> yeah there's so many things right now that we could be complaining about especially and it circles back to the ai itself is people that could just bitch and complain that like oh this this whole thing is done with ai so therefore it's completely invalid i think because it's assisted with AI. And there's one thing that I will rant about really quickly is there's people in the AI space that not only using AI assist for art, I think from my opinion, if you want to do a story or whatever, is perfectly fine, but they do AI assisted art and write the entire thing in chat GDP. It's like, did you even do anything? 
because I, I know it sounds hypocritical from a standpoint, but I don't I don't see the point in chat GDP if you can't physically write something out. Like I can see people's arguments of saying like, oh, it helped me do this, that, the other thing. But I believe in the human creativity in terms of writing, like above all else, you still have to sit down and write it. But I would create it's a whole different thing. Execution, that can be complained about. It's yeah. saying we didn't put any thought into it. Well, I just need yeah. more subjective. <laughs> yeah, I've never used chat GDP, and you can quote me on record. I never will unless unless I am being forced to by a job that requires me to do it or I will lose my job for whatever reason. But I don't see a purpose of it. If I have something in a story that isn't working, I will generally just come back to it and then it'll just it'll just go. But I don't really see the purpose of because there's that, that's the problem Amazon's having right now is there's so much chat GDP just crap that's just thrown out there mm-hmm. to like a mass market of people that make these either really fast novels that are just boom boom done with chat gdp and i guess the same argument can be made for the people that are using it for ai for art but i think you kind of can't compare an apple to an orange even though it's kind of in the same vein there's different things with different pieces if that makes sense no, that's good. And I'm like how you actually break this down and can justify every decision. Cause I see so many who just want to just, uh, just, they can't even explain the differences between any of this. Yeah. Well, my thought process is if you're going to go in and you don't have, you literally, the, the options against you making a graphic novel, especially people don't understand putting together a comic is fucking frustrating. The way that I write comics Other people do not agree because I don't write like panel one, panel two. I write a TV length script as like an episodic episode of television. And I translate that to a graphic novel. And people tell me that can't be done. You're an idiot. And I've said, all right, I've already done it five different times. That's how I write. Either do full screenplay or I write into like a TV episodic format because I think the writing format of comics is very limiting. While we've had a lot of great comics that have come out of the medium, I think a majority of the 22 page style is crap. Uh, A lot of people don't understand how limiting that is. You're literally, yes, that, that can show how talented you are as a writer to work within those parameters but i'm saying fuck your parameters i'm going to write how i want to write and i can explain to an artist how to translate that to a graphic novel page like perfect example there was an artist i was working with on a project that we may or may not still be going forward where he he was kind of confused by the language but i explained to him here you could use these angles that i've described with your pencil or digitally, and we can make angles with it and we can use it for uh, narrative framing devices and do something different with the medium. And everyone's told me, oh, that can't be done. That shouldn't be done. Go to how it is. And I'm like, no, I'm not going to do how it is. I'm going to do how I want to write. And if you don't like it, there's the door. Nice. That's how I had to do, um, trying to explain my art team on Lost Ranger when I was doing the Power Ranger series multiple people were confused because they're like that not only was english not their first language that was a barrier and i was able to work through and navigate that but they were like i don't understand why is there so much dialogue here i was like because it's broken up because it's like it's yeah you need it and that's the thing oh there's so many people in the ai space there's too much text there's too much there's too much narrative i was like that's what that's the graphic novel portion of the word novel it's like, really? Is Are we opposed to reading? I mean, I try, when you're trying to break down a page, you're trying to get as much of the script in without having to have unnecessary amount of additional pages, because sometimes you just have to include as much text in the scene as possible and break it up in a concise fashion. But certain people don't understand when you need to convey this, that, and the other thing, and it's already a 200 plus page graphic novel, you're trying to put in as much as you can and have a pace. If I were to include all of those points, it would just kind of seem random and it would just be sporadic because oh god forbid we need one sentence here we need one sentence here sorry if there's two paragraphs that you have to read in a in a in a part of the dialogue it's it's kind of how a narrative works Mm -hmm. which which certain people don't understand 
uh, altogether, uh, uh, do you recommend any writing classes or just write from your heart and just do some tips and tricks on YouTube tutorials? <laughs> I would listen to um, if you want to go the route. Yeah. If you want to go the route of schooling, if if it's fine, I don't really agree with a lot of the college institution system, especially with the economic factors. It's a sham. It, it is. It's it's one hundred percent a scam. Um, especially with, uh, I love how a lot of the people in the writing circles, when you go to get a writing job, oh, you need at least like 30 years of experience and like uh, two different degrees. It's like, um, I'm almost 30. How the fuck was I supposed to get 30 years of experience? Sorry, uh, I, I was in my mother's womb. I didn't realize I was a slacker. But um, I would go to, if you want the cheaper route, look up lectures, writing lectures on themes, stories, and ideas on YouTube. You can throw a hat. I don't necessarily have professors to recommend, but if you can find anything by Neil Gaiman, listen to what Neil Gaiman does about storytelling and structure. And there's multiple different, I think even Skillshare has lectures on them, but you can find either if you want classes, but mostly writing is all about self-expression in the purest form of your own self-identity and know how you write is all about how you are as a person certain people write differently like you brought up Christopher Nolan Christopher Nolan and his style and especially his writers write in a very you know it's a Christopher Nolan production because everybody has heavy monologues or has really strange camera movement like um you know it's a Nolan movie when the action a lot of the action is so it's confusing it's, yeah yeah oh god his like the the, the Bat, batman begins i love batman begins which i think is the most batman out of any of the two nolan movies because while his movies are good movies they are not good batman movies which have pissed people off every time one I better see. they're good dramas they're not good action movies yeah, no, uh, no one's Batman sucks ass. <laughs> I'm sorry, his Batman has the most impractical fighting style I've ever seen. And when you're trying to show one of the greatest martial artists, and he's like doing these weird elbow fighting styles, and it's all this fighting style that they were describing. And I'm like, this is the most impractical shit possible. Oh, it looks good on film. No, it doesn't. <laughs> if you look, at Bale's Batman. Bale's Batman could have a hundred percent knocked it out of the park, would have been more identifiable if he would have had a better fighting style. The thing that annoys me about Nolan and directors themselves with Batman specifically is they think that bringing Batman down to the realistic world works. Um, Matt Reeves brought his uh, Christopher Nolan made uh, Batman real, but Matt Reeves made batman's world real where nolan thought like oh we're just going to completely ground it but matt reeves tried to expand upon that by actually adding in some of the fantastical elements a lot of people think oh well we just need to make batman real and gritty when you do that you take something away from the fantasy because he's he's just an asshole in a costume it's like he's basically a cop it's like well, what's the point of batman nolan i think to his credit had some thought provoking drama in it, but in terms of Batman, it's very lackluster and very behind. Yeah. Uh, well, and I don't even see the point of even comparing and contrasting the different versions because, much like Sherlock Holmes and Robin Hood, there's going to be like maybe 50 more versions. <laughs> Exactly. In animated I'm, or live action form from this point on. <laughs> I'm very interested to see if Joel Schumacher's director's cut that Kevin Smith has talked about actually surfaces because Batman Forever, I think, is a really good version despite the goofiness and weirdness. There's a lot of... It's still a little eat. Tim Burton-esque. And yeah. why do you think that spokesperson said it's not in the same universe? I'm like, well, then why does it start out grim and then start getting into adam west type comical because they're still the same police chiefs and alfred butler so yeah uh each each the, batman has did that with james thing. bond where they're like yeah. oh it's like yeah it's like james the bond. same bond i'm like well this can't be the same bond because daniel craig's is set in today's time period which is supposed to be before brosnan which is clearly 90s so yeah uh, yeah no and he killed off him so each it has to batman be set after as it's has its own unique thing and i think one of the detriments that from warner brothers standpoint all the 
Superman it, kind of going on it. Superman has worked similarly. I think Superman and I think a lot of the bigger tentpole franchises, what sets it back is the studio wanting to make money. And what they should do from a narrative standpoint is just make TV shows that they can monetize off of. Smallville was a really good point. We went through several years before Superman Returns, before we got another Superman movie. And while yeah. Smallville smallville had its hits and misses i mean because it's it was a 2000 show on a on a network budget but what tom welling was able to do despite the flaws it has was able to tell a superman story even if we really didn't get superman but they still did it over a span of 10 years the Mm -hmm. fact that we never got anything like that i mean gotham i'm not counting gotham gotham sucks don't 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 come out with that (laughs) don't come out at me with that gotham was actually supposed to be what smallville was because um uh, alfred goff and miles miller when they were pitching smallville it was it was essentially gotham and they said no and they were like well what about superman and that's what led to that but i think that superman thrives especially with uh superman and lois like what they're doing on tv you can tell a more cohesive and better narrative threaded story than you can in a like a one to two hour movie because while those movies have really good special effects let's be honest Zack Snyder is not a really good writer in Man of Steel and his entire trilogy of movies if you can want to call it that is very style over substance there's not a lot of substance and the amount of fans that come up yeah, the, a lot of a lot of the fans that come out. Oh, there's just deeper, me- dude. There's not deeper meanings. It's a it's a dude, bro, who is Michael Bay levels of style over substance has a cult nature behind them, and and the studios just want to churn out as much IP crap as possible without somehow uh, shows like Superman and Lois got a really deep story, even if it had some like weird like cw ish elements i mean it's the cw you're gonna have that shit but at the heart of it it's still a really good representation of superman and i don't think besides like matt reeves the batman and other other things we have we have sorely missing that level with like batman because i think that could work well with batman or spider-man on tv where the movies have sorely failed because i think that's what they're missing out on and that kind of brings another can of worms especially with the streaming service uh, debacle we're going through is like uh, the nature of tv itself and streaming is going to change because of how shitty people are getting fucked over yeah you'd like to think so um i actually recommend the last three seasons of gotham those first two seasons are rough <laughs> i haven't really seen much of gotham the first i watched maybe the first episode and the last episode yeah. they did but a better I... takeover and bane origin story than they did in dark knight rises i'll just leave it at that <laughs> Let's just say, I think Batman and Robin had a better <laughs> Bane origin story than Rises. Oh, yeah. Well, plus those ice puns, baby. But, yeah, I mean, uh, it's going to be interesting to see how long before both the executives and the audience get sick of all these HBO Max guys who just seem to just want to piss everybody off. And James Gunn seems to be doing a good job justifying everything. but. The still the money men the vp of programming just seem to just want to keep goofing around and renaming this channel and everything their dc is at a really weird crossroads and so is marvel everybody since the first avengers movie has said oh dc is never going to compare to marvel well interestingly enough and max landis has pointed this out the structure of comics and movies are actually on the same trajectory and it's kind of scary. Marvel has always had the big event saturation problem where DC always had the convoluted inaccurate story method of like, this would happen, this would get shelved. And now that's literally being presented as it's been since like the forties in comics on film. And it's really weird because DC ever since the flash came out, ever since blue beetle came out, they're having a problem left and right structurally. It's that with, damn Batgirl thing already. That oh, the whole Batgirl thing pisses me off. Cause while according to the inside executives, they said, Oh, it was, it was terrible. It was this or that. Why don't you let the audience decide? They literally had an entire movie. The screenings done. don't say anything. Cause half the time yeah. the movie's unfinished. It's effect the screening shots. said the flash was the best superhero movie of all time. That should tell you something. 
Yeah, they don't know what they're talking about. And it's all focus group related bullshit. At the end of the day, it's out of touch CEOs and corporate executives like David Zaslav, Bob Iger. By the way, there's a funny side tidbit. I saw something when one of the, the when the strikes first started, there was somebody wearing a crooked Disney uh, Mickey Mouse uh, mascot uniform, and he was handing out T-shirts that said, fuck Bob Iger outside of Disneyland. I'm like, that yeah. is awesome. I was like, that is awesome. But you have out of touch CEOs that are just like, oh, well, what IP do we have? David Zaslav is talking about Harry Potter and Lord of the Rings being their top uh, IPs that they have that need to be utilized. And it's like, no, they fucking don't. It's one of those, obviously, businesses need a business and that whole model has to go away. But it's a studio saying, what can we exploit and what do we know we can make money on? Well, we finished the last Harry Potter in what, mm-hmm. 2011? Oh, well, we're just going to remake it into a seven seven season to 10 season long tv show where we can rake in as much advertiser money on that as possible while meanwhile they're bleeding in an arm and a leg i don't know with how much blue beetle and everything is lost especially with all the movies that are flopping how the fuck they're gonna uh, support james gunn's air quote cinematic universe when they don't have any fucking money it's like, where are you getting this money from? Even wow. Marvel is having trouble. Because Disney is, go, relies on free advertising. Yeah, Disney is scaling back because Disney, if anybody has been paying attention to the MCU, everything is failing. Like, everything is crashing. People are sick and tired of it. Oh, like, but don't tell pe- that to the adver- advert fans who are going to suck them off till they're dry, you know? <laughs> <laughs> Disney, okay, I'm going to say a really hot take here. There's th- this is the all same, hot takes. It's all good. <laughs> the same thing that made Marvel popular is the reason that the CW universe was popular for the same reason as there was no other alternative. That's the exactly. only reason we why they anything. were popular. They didn't have anything. So when you saw a Captain America movie that was a really good war drama that turned into an episode of Power Rangers, nobody nobody questioned it. I was so invested when i saw the first trailer for captain america but the second i saw lasers and i saw everything else i said we're in an episode of power rangers i'm like i can see that they didn't want to do the full saving private ryan but you mean to tell me that it wouldn't be kick ass if marvel made literally saving private ryan from captain america from captain america's perspective i think that's a that's a fucking close to a billion dollar movie right there you mean to tell me that wouldn't sell putting captain america on the front lines as like a secondary character to a war drama in the marvel universe and they literally just dropped the ball because disney was like oh well we can't have gunfire we can't have all this let's have some laser beams oh we can't show we can't show nazis we we can show uh chris hemsworth's ass that's that's perfectly fine yeah we can have star lord (laughs) flipping the guy off but we can't have language no it's it's the there's so many things with disney that just absolutely annoy me from a creative standpoint and especially with god bless sam raimi him going to replace Scott Derrickson for Doctor Strange. I mean, there are Sam Raimi elements, but you could tell he was just a hired gun. Like, I mean, they were literally... Oh, uh, hell, his him. was one of the few I could stand. Because everyone else, like you say, was just people who took the job but didn't know anything about it. It was like the people they hired for, like, Captain Marvel and, uh, you know, it was just like, but these are indie people who don't do superhero stuff. Why'd they accept this? exactly like um i can't think I like of taika name. watiti's other work but you try yeah. watching his thor movies and you're like that's not taika watiti that's taika mm-hmm. talking to disney and having them interpret his thoughts exactly that's a thing that we really need and i'm kind of happy in a way that the strike happened just on a fun a lot of people basis. share your thoughts it's just they well, often get outed and acted like and uh, I, I i have lost all respect for any kind of comic book fans half the time because a lot of them are just the most Jeez. petulant kids who just don't have any manners like i when i saw that there were people who were beating up a kid who gave away the ending of Endgame, i was like okay he's a douche you can call him out on it but they're like oh we're gonna kick him almost to death i'm like okay yeah no. two wrongs don't make a right do i have to bring out we're gonna do it with great power comes great responsibility nerds <laughs> like you live to become the villain (laughs) exactly like there it's such it's so dogmatic and that's why i don't get into star wars or anything because it's like oh you like this star wars movie well we're gonna find out where you live and we're gonna put your fucking address on the internet eat eat shit it's like are are you people five years old it's like the same 
we're not going to get heavy into politics because I have a, a rule just as as a person. I do not adhere to politics due to it. Nothing good comes out of it. There's nothing substantive. There's nothing that could be gained from it. It's just literally two people on an oppositional courtyard bitching at different rhetoric points at each other. And that's what a lot of film and television has been brought into, especially video games. It's like, do we really have nothing better to do than find ways to divide each other based on stupid principle shit that's supposed to be entertainment? Yeah. What is entertainment nowadays? Oh God! Like Disney, Disney right now. Oh, sorry, my dog is howling at a siren. <laughs> okay, we're almost wrapped up here. <laughs> Disney right now is in such a weird space that the uh, strikes itself was actually probably a good thing because no, hear me out. From a good standpoint, as in they needed to shut down because Disney was in the factory cookie cutter filmmaking standpoint and. Now Daredevil has been shut down. Pretty much every movie they had has shut down. Hopefully, and this is just wishful thinking, that it'll actually give them time to focus on the script because from where it stands right now, there's nothing interesting that Disney, excuse me, has that's coming out. I mean, the only thing that I was looking forward to for years was Moon Knight and Moon Knight turned into Scooby-Doo meets Night at the Museum. And I was like, I was so distraught from a creative standpoint uh, because Moon Knight... My my three growing up were Daredevil, Spider-Man, and Moon Knight. And the second I heard they're making a Moon Knight show, and I'm like, yes. And they're like, Disney Plus. And I'm like, fuck. And I'm, because <laughs> I was waiting for Netflix to make the Moon Knight show. Because I'm like, oh, yeah, Moon Knight would fit perfectly in for Netflix for that Punisher Dark Edge or something like that. And instead, we just got this this crap. And it's not Oscar Isaac's fault. And too many people have said, oh, you're too dogmatic. It's it's a different take. Because if you're not familiar, Moon Knight has so many different takes in the comics. There's there's like the the early run where he was like very like um werewolf by night. And then you have the like one where people misinterpret him as like a Batman ripoff. And then you got the weird psychological thing, and they were trying to like wrap everything together. But man, it just did not fundamentally work at all for me and it, it mostly due to the fact it was only six episodes it's like are, are you really trying to tell a long-form story in six I saw a episodes bunch of people. uh it's like they just want to just everything has to be a limited series but half the time these people won't even configure in the other stuff i'm afraid of them bringing back all these other daredevil characters because i'm like see but that was raw I know Kevin Feige doesn't have the same attention span as all those other guys who were making gritty drama. Yeah, Kevin Fe- I think Kevin Feige, well, he, he's been in the game of comic book movies, and I hate even using the term comic book comic book movie. They're movies that have comic book characters. But he was been there on the ground floor. I think too much of one person having a vision is a bad thing. And I think it definitely shows with the direction of the MCU. I think you need to remove Kevin Feige. I mean, if that's if I was in charge, that's what I would do. And I would just have a new vision and have somebody else's vision come in. Because clearly them repeating the same thing over and over and over and over and over and over again, people are now starting to be like, this sucks. I'm done. Yeah, it's, we just need a change in management anyway. It's got to be like judges, as we're seeing now. Oh, uh, they should not have yeah. lifetime sentence. They should be excused after 10 to 20 years saying, you done your job, good or bad, but you got to go. <laughs> exactly. That's why I'm curious, but also cautiously optimistic for what James Gunn is going to do. Because I really enjoy, I haven't seen Third Guardians, but I've enjoyed, enjoyed pretty much everything that James Gunn has done. Just from a fact of like, he has his own ideas and what he wants to do and his version of suicide squad i thought was pretty good hit seeing him tackle superman is going to be interesting because i want to see if he can pull it off i mean i think he can but how he's going to do the rest of the dc universe with like i mean he'll have the oversight but hopefully we'll have unique creative visions throughout as opposed to just one giant overload like snyder crap fest if that makes sense Mm mm-hmm it's very eye-opening, and it's kind of about a matter of just, we can't have our cake and eat it. <laughs> no, 
the thing that we became as comic book fans was complacent with being given so much crap and just taking what we could get. I mean, we're getting to the point where we're at, we're at where Batman and Robin was before. <laughs> yes. Like Thor Love and Thunder was that level of bad and like Morbius and like the Venom movies. Oh, Morbius definitely, just, yeah. We're just, the, any attention is good attention. How, and it's like, when you have how a bad have we fallen as fans of media and media production in general, where you can't make a Venom movie without Spider-Man when you own the intellectual property of Spider-Man? And it's it just how do you fuck up Venom first and foremost and make it PG-13? They've done it twice. It's going to be yeah. like Fantastic Four. But I'm like, see, the damage is done. I, I, I love John Krasinski. He's great as Jack Ryan on Jim on The Office. And he's a good director in his own right. I don't. I don't need to see any more Fantastic Four. It's just been done. They're doing it with the Captain America universe. And it's like, yeah. I like Harrison Ford. I actually dug the final Indiana Jones movie, even though the studio marketing and everything fucked it up. I'm like, yeah. see, what? at least it wasn't a Disney item. That was Mangold Have you ever one. Have seen Disney. the uh, Roger Corman unreleased Fantastic Four? I, I had a lot of fun with it, but I everyone's... Love, I love that movie. That is one of my favorite uh, independent movies and the fact that it never got released i think is a crime and you know what disney should do somebody should really the cast should get together i don't believe that avi Arad actually burned those copies i think no, that they, that's they, just they, them they are face. they are out there somewhere and i think it deserves to see the light of day because i i like I like the first Tim story Fantastic Four, but like Rise of the Silver Surfer, it just felt like a bad comic book. And we're not going to talk about Fan Four Stick because I don't have alcohol on on standby. <laughs> that movie was. I remember an ex of mine. We were doing themed months, like we would watch movies, and by the time her and I watched Fantastic Four, uh, uh, the the remake, she just said, "What the fuck are we watching?" <laughs> Play through she was like what the fuck happened because by the time the story gets going it's over and you're like what <laughs> you're like, what the fuck just happened mm -hmm. and god it's i think it has to do with so many things are ip brand now everything which is what i've already said everything is ip brand but that doesn't have to mean that just because you have an ip focused movie you have to solely adhere to it perfect example is the fucking burpee movie for christ's sake I mean, oh. yeah, it's an IP brand. I haven't seen it. I don't have any really feelings on it, but the fact that it made I can't a billion... stand Gerwig's satire. It's not, it's just very dry. It's just that kind where I'm like, okay, and so what? And I'm saying thing with Nolan. I, everyone's just like, oh, yeah, you must be on one of those crazy propaganda bandwagons. I'm like, no, it's still, it can be, it's no different than the Lego movie. It's pretending to be satirical, but it's not clever. It's not brilliant. It's still a I toy haven't commercial. seen the Barbie movie, but the fact that it made a billion dollars at the box, it, it's sad when the last few Marvel movies haven't even touched a billion, and what touched a billion was the fucking Barbie movie. Oh, it's more <laughs> it's than like... that, dude. Uh, how about the fact that people thought Mad Max was award-worthy or Mission Impossible? It should be 90% on Ryan, Ronnie, Ronnie Tomatoes. I'm like, people are really deluded if you think I... that is the final consensus on a movie based on the number of reviews. But what and are the reviews actually saying? It just came out that Rotten Tomatoes was completely biased. If you saw that whole thing, a lot of those reviews were paid and everyone, I'm just like, in breaking news, water is wet. Half the time <laughs> they misread the reviews. So half the time you'll even look at movies that scored zero to 16% and you're like, uh, that's clearly a positive review. No, that's the why thing... I like Metacritic because they'll actually dissect what are the mixed versus mediocre versus good versus excellent high praise. The like with the whole studio uh, format, the thing that annoyed me, one of my favorite independent franchises of all time, uh, a movie you should check out called He Never Died with Henry Rollins. It was this guy named I've seen Jack. That. Yeah. yeah, I fucking love that movie. What they did with the sequel pissed me off because it sucked. Um, they pitched an entire like series and they couldn't get funding for it because of the Hollywood studio system. And I'm like, that movie 
was it was like so original and how dark and fucked up it was and hilarious that the fact that they couldn't get funding and meanwhile we get like three venom movies now is like a crime against cinema and you're just sitting here like how are how it's like who who is sitting here in these studio boardrooms where they're like okay we made a moderate success with the first venom movie what are we gonna do I know, let's just do the same thing, but make it worse. <laughs> to just continue yep. that. And mm -hmm. then it's the same studio that re-released Morbius because they didn't understand a joke. It's like, no, we weren't siding with you. We were making fun of you with how bad it was. Yep. And now they're making a Craven movie with Aaron Taylor Johnson and it's R-rated and he's got like lion powers i was like i want to know who is like doing the line of cocaine in these pitch meetings it's like it's like okay so it's like aaron taylor johnson right but he's like he's got like lion powers like lino from like thundercats but it's like it's like rated r and it's like we're gonna make a billion dollars because it's related to spider-man oh does spider-man show up in the movie no but well, are the fans gonna know that until they see the movie no yeah and the fact Ridiculous. that they the fact that they haven't brought back Andrew Garfield, unlike any of these, like it's so it's they brought him back in No Way Home. But that was my other issue, too. I was like I, one critic who wasn't clearly being paid <laughs> set it up best where he was just like, do you really care at the end of the day? And I was like, my thoughts exactly. See, this is why Star Trek is the only thing that or even Back to the Future that understands time travel. Make it funny. Because when you get to exactly. be technical, you get distracted by the plot holes, the science, all the other shit that doesn't ultimately matter. The thing with No Way Home that I've said, I'm grateful that we got the previous actors to come back. But at the end of the day, I wish we had a better movie supporting it. Mm -hmm. Because it's like, yeah, you could bring back Toby, you could bring back Andrew. But the way that they, they brought them in, I mean, I know it was probably during COVID times, they probably couldn't shoot on location. And probably shooting on location probably... Yeah, they're all CGI'd anyone. after the fact together. <laughs> yeah, it's like you could have done something interesting where you could have opened up the movie and you could have had the villains be plucked from having a different battle that we hadn't seen before with the actors and you could show them in their own universes and do that but in the same right i think the direct i think john watts made the good decision in not doing that because it was a tom focused movie but then and he was definitely a hired gun look at him his career has expanded he did he was doing stuff beforehand now he's doing tv and other stuff that he wants to actually do I think, like, the higher gun mentality, like, I just feel so bad because John Watts has no visual identity as a director. It's just blanket Marvel template. Like, everything just looks bland. It's shot very generically. You can tell you they pretty much, all they do is do close-ups of the actors and all the effects and second unit guys do their own thing. One of my one of my buddies, he works in VFX, and he his company is blacklisted from Marvel because they unionized and said, "Fuck you, we're not going to work under these conditions." They're like, "All right, see ya." And now look what now look what Marvel's doing. Marvel can't compete, and people used to bitch, "Oh well, Marvel's really good at the effects." You no, know, just look at DC, and now both are fumbling the ball. If anybody on the Flash, they apparently they said they got those effects done in a week. <sighs> I'm like, are you serious? Like a week? That they're like, that's that's not even that's not even possible, dude. And that definitely explains we have an oversaturation problem, and that's another reason why people are are striking right now because the writers and actors, everything is put under a pressure cooker. And will it get better? To be quite honest, probably not. <laughs> no. With the way that the studio mentality is, they want. They want the same system. It's kind of, oh God, it keeps going back to politics. It's like inner, it's like inner politics of them wanting to keep the castle and not want to pay the people in the village. And they're wondering yep. why the castle is getting shut down and they're not, they're not having their third pile of hidden gold. It's like at the end of the day, capitalism aside, you need to really sit back and look at your moral foundations. If you have any, it's like, it reminds me of what's going on with a lot of the actors from power rangers the original power rangers actors three of them um because the show was non-union they were only getting paid about six hundred dollars a week for working 14 hours and you could have made that at mcdonald's and they went because the 
the uh, the franchise was like already in its first year making like a billion dollars in toy sales. And by the time the second season rolled around, three of the main actors, Austin St. John, Walter Jones, and Dewey Trang, they banded together and said, we're going to do what's right and we're going to stand up, not because we want more money. We want to be able to, you know, afford health care. We want to do this. We want to do that. And I am Saban, Hayam Saban, the creator, said – you're replaceable. What do we need you for? Because they operated on the mindset because the original show that it was based off of in Japan changed actors every season. So they could, they felt they were at a, we have nothing to lose. What are we going to pay you? So they fucking sacked them. And it's the same thing we're dealing with now, like 30 years later, and it hasn't changed where you get so many studios that are into the dogmatic mindset of, oh, here's what everybody is think, what we think they're owed and that that's it like you get you get kids that are being paid more than adults and people that are unevenly paid and it's everything's all fucked up and now they're netflix are still the only ones who have not surrendered to the strike they are going to just keep bleeding these guys dry with their mafia tactics netflix i think has the biggest thing to lose and they're trying to save face because they're we won't release our streaming numbers the fact they won't release their numbers and the fact that they're bleeding money because if they don't have content, they might have content in the can. They think that they can stall out the writers and they can stall out the actors. You can't stall out both. Something's got to give. The bridge can't support all the And the feds you... are definitely going to start looking at it and probably oh, yeah. make there them is, forfeit. There's going to be, mark my words, I have said it, there's going to be not only federal investigations, but there's going to be... Um, more studio level investigations to a lot of how the studio systems are run because they are run through mafia tactics through different uh financial opportunities tax incentives i mean that's the whole reason why the batgirl movie didn't get released because of a tax write-off and meanwhile warner brothers is claiming in other studios they're claiming oh we're broke you're making billions of dollars and you're being able to pay off investors and cycle in money but you're broke something doesn't add up from a math standpoint and i have like a eighth grade math level (laughs) yeah math are hard yeah well if you have any other things you want to bring in or we can bring it to a close or something absolutely Uh, i think it pretty much just summed up a lot of just the wrongs in the world and how People have to find their own voice and stop surrendering to this is what I do. This is what I'm big on and everything. (laughs) Yeah, definitely. If you want, um, you guys can check me out on Amazon. You can look up John Osmet, O-S-M-E-T-T. I think it's still on Amazon unless they decided to remove me for whatever reason. But you can find all my books there. And even if you look up uh, our Instagram page, Planet Eight One Seven Comics, you can see a lot of the stuff that we have worked on, stuff we've done in the past, things we might have in the future. Slow and steady, but we're still in the race. Uh, I love it. I love the optimism. Yeah, we're ch- if I refused, when you have major studios that like want to bully you around, the the only time I've ever received anything negative from a studio was Warner Brothers. Was I got threatened in an email because I wanted to make a, a graphic novel series. I wanted to make a remake of Smallville on like an indie fan like perspective, and I put out uh, our first uh, poster for it, and I received a cease and desist. I'm like, but nothing else that I did <laughs> warranted that. But Smallville, that's where they gatekeep. <laughs> oh boy yeah it is what it is <laughs> totally totally and glad you can just stay afloat and you've given plenty of material to think about well thank you thank you for having me it was a pleasure being here anytime and uh, uh keep staying afloat and just give them hell i'll do my best where is this going to be available at uh, you can find it on Anchor, Podbean, Spotify, and I'll I'll keep updating you. I'm gonna drop it, a comic book themed week, and uh, I can even send you the raw file ahead of time if you want. Let me know. Okay, sweet. I can give you links to include if you want. Okay, yeah, that that would actually be very helpful. Okay, sweet. Well, I'll go ahead and take uh take care, and you take care, and everyone out there stay safe. All right, Godspeed. We'll return after these messages. 
Hey, it's Brent Pope, the host of Breakfast with Brent Pope. You've seen me on some of your favorite TV shows saying things like, give it up, Jimmy. You got to sink this putt to win. On Breakfast with Brent Pope, I sit down with guests from the entertainment world and we do it all over breakfast. Or should I say breakfast? Every week on Breakfast, you get inside Hollywood info and tips, great breakfast wrecks and booty debates. Most of all, you get the most delightful 30 minutes of your week. So dig in. It's breakfast time. Listen at breakfast.com, Apple Podcasts, or wherever fine podcasts are found. Do you ever find yourself thinking about who would win in a fight between Goku and Superman? Hi, I'm James Gavsey, and on the Who Would Win show, me and my co-host Ray ignore anything important happening in the outside world and debate fictional battles between characters from comics, movies, and video games. We got a new show every week, and almost always, am I the winner? Yeah, not true, Ray. In the past, we've discussed such matches as Captain America versus Darth Vader, Solid Snake versus the Iron Giant, classic matchups like RoboCop versus Terminator, and even the Muppets versus Sesame Street. That one was crazy. So if you're a fan of geek culture and love a spirited debate, check out the Who Would Win Show wherever you get your podcasts or check us out at whowouldwinshow.com. Follow us on the web on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. The podcast is available on Podbean, Spotify, iHeartRadio, Anchor, Apple, and anywhere else podcasts are available. Feel free to review our show and leave comments on any of those sites. Thanks a million for listening. It's a jacked up.